tonight, the new world of Australian prisons. At Goulburn Jail in New South Wales, a shadow of our darkest penal past falls daily. Inmates are separated along racial lines to stop them murdering one another. The nature of the inmate these days is a lot more brutal and violent now because they've been you know, brutalised or dehumanised, especially in Goulburn. Across the way, hidden from view, are the so-called men in black. In a desperate situation, they will resort to lethal force. When you're managing some of the toughest people that ever walked the corridors of a jail in Australia, you have to have some people at some stage may have to stand nose to nose to some of these tough criminals and say now do as you're told or else. And if they decide the or else, um, you have to take the appropriate action. Across the wall, another yard separates the worst from the worst. Within a 19th century prison is a 21st century facility, an exclusive domain for serial murderers and gang leaders, with additional provision for future terrorists. This is for AA classified inmates. That means terrorists? That's terrorists. There's uh, legislation being drawn up, agreements between the states, that a terrorist inmate uh, could go to bed in one state, in a jail, and wake up in this jail. Goulburn Jail, the end of the line for Australia's criminals, is also a timeline of Australian prison reform. I don't have happy memories of it. It was a place where you had uh, staff over several generations from the same families who'd worked there, and so their concept of what a prison should be and how prisoners should be dealt with was cast in stone. So it was a very difficult and challenging place. In 20 years, the Australian prison population has doubled. Tonight, we look at how the system copes with the pressure cooker as we go inside Australia's toughest jail. don't understand. There is no life behind these walls, especially on big sentences. You can pretend there's a life, you can fool yourself, but it doesn't matter what you do, that wall is between you and your life. At Goulburn Jail there is every day a First Fleet Echo when they ring the bell to call officers to parade in the way the Royal Marines did two centuries ago. In the cell blocks where inmates are called to muster, the various floors are still known as decks. Over the centuries, there is much about the routine of doing time that does not change. A lot of people don't realise and understand when you're in jail, it's a different life. It's a different world. What these rules of society don't apply in there. Really, it's a dog-eat-dog, -dog. it's a jungle. Seriously, it is. Williams. But in the last quarter of a century in particular, efforts have been made to escape the legacy of a prison's history described by one royal commissioner as brutal, savage, and sometimes sadistic. Few outsiders have seen more than Tony Vinson, who first saw the inside of a jail as a New South Wales parole officer in the 1950s. Twenty years on, as chairman of New South Wales Corrective Services, then Dr Vinson struggled with sometimes violent criminals and hostile staff, as well as an unsympathetic public, to change a seemingly intractable system. Who wants to build a career um, based on other people's suffering? Who wants to derive any kind of satisfaction from incarcerating other people? The only ambition you should have is to contest 
those deep-seated biases and prejudices which exist in the community and which I found to be unmatched by the people I was dealing with. In the 1960s, Ron Woodham tossed in his shearer's job to join the New South Wales prison staff. Like Tony Vinson, his career also straddled this turbulent time. Now New South Wales Commissioner of Corrective Services, the man the prisoners call Rotten Ron has survived corruption allegations, death threats and even being taken hostage as he also struggled to manage the pressure for change. There's some prisoners that I'm not on their Christmas card mailing list and I don't want to be and uh, I don't believe in, in the way they operate. I've been against them, they know that. They also know that I and my senior staff are fair but firm if they want to conform. So even if they're going against us and they decide at some stage to come back into a compliant mode of operation that will help them. How did you get your nickname? Uh, from the right days when we were in the response teams in the 80s. So did that mean that you had to, to bash back? No, not really. We, uh, um, after the Nagel Royal Commission, when they looked at the riot at Bathurst where prisoners were shot and um, you couldn't identify who used what gun at the end because they were all thrown in a heap, there was recommendations in relation to responding to that type of situation. Twice in the 1970s there were riots at Bathurst Jail. Prisoners had been systematically bashed by guards. Prisoners gave very, very graphic accounts to the Royal Commission of hearing the cries as, as it came nearer and nearer, cell by cell, and knew, knew that what, what they could expect. A couple of screws grabbed me, hit me on the head, battens, and I fell down. And another bloke there kicked me in the head, busted my skull open here. He then proceeded to bash the back of my head in with a baton. He then said, I don't think I'd better say that word, I've broke the baton, somebody give me another one. Two years after the second riot, the Nagel Royal Commission began to address decades of neglect. Institutions and attitudes set in stone are hard to budge. Goulburn Jail was built 120 years ago to the same plan as Bathurst. Yards like these across Australia became new battlegrounds under new pressure to embrace the 20th century. Goulburn was built in 1884 and uh, that's not ideal because environment can affect behaviour but although it's an 1884 jail we have uh, 21st century officers working there and they employ 21st century practices as possible. The New South Wales experience was mirrored across the nation. Through the 1980s and 1990s, there were prison riots in Pentridge, Boggo Road and Yatla, the most recent this year at Risdon in Tasmania. Over that time, the same trends have been evident. Better policing, stronger remand conditions, longer sentences and tough public attitudes herded more people into jail. While crime rates came down, imprisonment rates doubled, if unevenly, across the nation. Queensland in the first period of the first Goss government actually reduced their imprisonment rate. I think Western Australia more recently have been doing the, some of the same thing. The Victorians have kept their imprisonment rate relatively low. It's half of New South Wales and less than half than a lot of other states. Northern Territory has always had a very, very high, disproportionately high imprisonment rate. The high imprisoning states historically have been those with high indigenous uh, populations, particularly the Northern Territory, Western Australia, um, have been the two high imprisoning states, followed by Queensland and, and now New South Wales. A building boom saw new prisons constructed, the New South Wales Corrective Services budget doubling in 10 years. 
Uh, we're coping very well, as a matter of fact. Um, in 1998, we formed what was called the Towards 2000 Task Force, which uh, led us to, uh, in our planning and def demographic study of New South Wales, to predict that we'd have 9,000 prisoners in 2005. What worries me is that I think um, there's a great confusion which is being fostered by the department and by the commissioner that somehow it's a good thing for the prison population to grow uh, upwards and upwards so that, for example, in the last 10 years we've had a 50% increase. How much more is this costing the taxpayer? Well, the current rate um, to keep a, someone in maximum security in a New South Wales jail at the moment is running at over $200, some quite say $220 a day. I mean, I know, I know prisoners and ex-prisoners who say they'd stay out of jail for half of that and it's only a joke, but, I mean, there's a serious point behind it. As the numbers rose through the 1990s, Australian prison deaths also doubled. Goulburn became known as the Killing Fields, with seven murders in three years. Christopher Binns, who spent one-third of his life in jail for crimes such as armed robbery, knows what it feels like to be stabbed by an inmate. He was in Goulburn until earlier this year. It's a very poor jail. No one's got nothing and everybody's trying to do their best. But, you know, oh, can I lend this and lend that? Sometimes people say no or whatever. Over a pair of runners. People have died over a pair of runners because no one can afford that. They want to stand over. It's shit at the end of the day. A new problem was developing as rival gangs parried. Here, at a different jail, Asian inmates attack Aboriginal rivals. The old blue-on-green violence, where blue-uniformed prison officers fought green-uniformed prisoners, was being overtaken by green-on-green -green violence. There's a friendship, there's alliances with certain groups within the, uh, within the prison system, you know, the Aussies, the Islanders and the Asians, they hang out together there, you know, they're, they're cool, you know. The Lebanese and the Aboriginals, they hang out together and the Chinese, they're cool, you know. If there's an assault by an Asian inmate on an Aboriginal inmate, the Aboriginal inmate will go back to his people and they will number up and then try and square off with the Asian inmate. It's just a cycle which just increases its snowballs. So if there's a jail murder, is it a typically a one-on-one -on -one episode? Not typically a one-on-one -on -one episode in a jail murder. It's normally pre-arranged, the type of murders that happened in Goulburn. Um, inmates would plan it out so they'd be shielded by other inmates from closed-circuit TV cameras. There would be passing of weapons between inmates to destroy all the evidence very difficult environment to work in. Australia was copying American jail violence with local white pride gangs forming in opposition to other ethnic gangs. Gang warfare outside was now being concentrated inside. There's the gangs that were at war in southwest Sydney we now have those two gangs in custody in New South Wales. They were shooting each other in broad daylight, brazen unlawlessness in uh, the streets of Sydney. Years ago, we'd just get a principal or one or two members of the gang. Very seldom we'd get the leaders. Uh, now it's not uncommon for us to receive the whole gang. The whole gang gets uh, arrested and convicted and, uh, and some of them are getting very long sentences and to them, some of them are very young with very long sentences. The danger to us is that it's unacceptable to them. At Goulburn, in response, they've taken to what is known as ethnic clustering. Yard six has the Asians, yard seven, the Islanders, yard eight, the Arabic prisoners, and in varied yards, the many Aborigines. Separating the different ethnic groups requires close management. Even food is isolated. Intelligence is gathered to identify ringleaders who are moved away from their power base. But the gang problem in jail is under control because we've got that capability of movement. 
some of these young people that are coming off the street now, it's the first time in their life where they've been made do what someone else wants them to do. They have no say if we open their cell door at 11 o'clock at night and say you're moving from Lithgow to Goulburn because you're going to get yourself into trouble if you stay here any longer. If you'd have talked to superintendents two or three years ago, they would have said gangs are one of the biggest problems they've got in modern day prison in New South Wales. And now that's not the case. I think you need to go beyond that and, 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 and redress um, you know, the causes of, of disturbance and the feelings of hostility between different groups. I think in the longer term, particularly when people are released, it's undesirable. I think it is subject to abuse and the possibility of it being utilised by, by prison authorities to, to, to pay off debts or square off and so on. And I think it's just, as I say, a capitulation to the problems rather than an attempt to deal with them. When the ethnic clustering policy was introduced in 2001, New South Wales had the highest prisoner-to-prisoner -prisoner violence in Australia. Within the confines of the cell blocks, where suspicion and treachery rule more severely than the guards, many inmates believed it was all a plot, that violence was orchestrated and the clustering was a means of restricting them from work and education. They want them to be guarded vegetables. Believe me, brain fucked, you know, dysfunctional people. Inmates, because they're easier to manage. Once you start teaching them things, start learning, giving them opportunities and exercising their brain, then they become um, dangerous in their mind because they, they feel insecure. Seriously. But the policy did have one inescapable benefit. It was necessary. Since we did it in 1998, there hasn't been a repeat murder. The next outbreak of violence, as it turned out, had serious consequences for the guards. According to Christopher Binns, separation of Aborigines and Arabic inmates had generated tension. Uh, the Lebanese were a little bit disappointed. The Kuris were a little bit disappointed because their friendship with the Lebanese and what they were able to offer was uh, reduced. So they weren't, they weren't happy, they weren't impressed, so they thought, oh, we'll make a statement, fuck you, you know, we'll take it, we'll run the ball up, and they they run the ball up. The jail never rioted. One small wing of Aboriginal inmates rioted, and that was generated by a core, hard group of inmates who had nothing to lose. In April 2002, in this cell block, prisoners attacked staff with table legs and a didgeridoo. These images were captured soon after. Seven male and female officers were injured. One, Timothy Swain, suffering serious brain damage. Officers got hurt. Was yeah. that right that they got hurt? I don't, listen, I, don't, I can only I answer for myself. You know, I speak for myself, I can't speak for others. You know, I don't like to see these things happen. Um, and I like to see no one get hurt, you know, but you know, we live in a, a, a society where it's pretty, a golden society, is uh, it's just ruthless. The disturbance was broken up by the jail's immediate action team, ever watchful in the wings. Their job is not for the faint-hearted. That particular one there, Chris, it, it's just a, a metal spike. And they were taken out of mattress spaces uh, in the jail here. And as a result of that, of course, we had to uh, replace uh, over 400 beds with um, solid frame mattress spaces. And something like this? I mean... Arming up for offensive or defensive purpose has become a prison routine. The most common weapon, a sharpened toothbrush. We've got pocket grenades here. The riot response teams carry very different weapons. The principal leveller used when they rush outnumbered into the yards is this capsicum spray. We've also got um, <coughs> these aerosols, same product, so yes, um, mainly used for if we need an instant um, reaction, say a big fight in the yard. They're not breaking up, this gas vest never goes in the yard, but every other operator carries these. 
So you just pull the pin out, squirt, nine times out of ten, fight's over. Come on, let's get out! They train constantly. Prison officers in prison garb confront the men the prisoners have come to know as the gang squad. If you can introduce chemical agents into a situation when it escalates to force being used, you minimise injuries to both sides, to the inmates and to staff and particularly staff. I don't want my staff being knocked around. They don't get paid enough money to be punching bags for thugs. He is to come out of this doorway with his hands on his head and he'll be met by men in black. Over. The New South Wales Corrective Services Department has grown an even stronger arm with its hostage response measures. With Alpha One, team will enter. One, back, <laughs> two, even office staff are taught the fundamentals of self-defence. So why do they need these skills? Well, uh, the officers obviously need them because they're dealing with the inmates on a day-to-day -day basis, as, long as, as well as the nurses um, in the clinics, in the, in the centres. Probation and parole, they actually go out to uh, houses, for offenders' houses, and they're sort of out there on their own without any sort of support or backup. The men in black undertake intense hostage negotiation training as well as close combat. The work is taken seriously. Snipers are trained to shoot to kill. Chris, it's called a cold barrel shot. Of course, if a marksman or sniper, if you will, um, has to use lethal force, that's the conditions that they would use it under, and they're trained on that and have to submit targets every month. Um, but that's the absolute worst case scenario. We would only use lethal force to avoid um, somebody else being killed. I think that the, the ramping up of security, the resources devoted to security, the ramping up of the, the, the riot squads, the increased equipment, the, the increased number of cell searches and so on, there's a much stronger control that's operating within the prisons at the moment than there certainly was in, in the, the pre-naval period. Now we have an era where the department for the first time is run by experienced correctional administrators. And I think we have a good balance now. We don't have the issues of food um, and conditions that we had in the 1970s. Escort OIC from 2IC, Polair requests our location, over. Escort OIC to Polair. Escort approximately one zero minutes from Zulu 1, over. OIC from 2IC, Polair copied last, over. The stronger arm has also meant escapes in New South Wales have been all but arrested. The weakest link, the movement between prisons and courts, has been strengthened to a point where it would take a small army to break an inmate out as they are delivered to Goulburn. Having ended up in the forerunner to Supermax and having escaped from maximum security prisons twice, Christopher Binns is an expert on the subject. What about the HRMU, the Supermax? Is that unbreakable? I'd say it would be. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty uh, secure, that place. Once inside the outer perimeter, the van passes into a second prison, the HRMU, the High Risk Management Unit, better known as the Supermax. OK, what I'm going to do is perform a regulation strip search, you understand? Yep. What I want you to do is do exactly what I tell you to do. Don't get in front of me. If I tell you to stop, stop what you're doing, wait for further instructions, yeah, you understand that? Good. Take your overalls off, turn them inside out. Very few inmates see this place. Indeed, this is the first time cameras have broken in since it began operating in 2001. 
The Supermax is home for 34 of Australia's 24,000 prisoners. What will greet them in their 2 by 4 metre cell is plastic plates and cutlery, a bunk, a sink and toilet. In time they may earn the right to a television set and only in this way perhaps learn of the pedigree of fellow inmates. Malat was given the harshest sentence possible for the seven murders, jailed for the term of his natural life. The total sentences is 613 years plus 20 natural life sentences. That's natural life. And those 20 life sentences are shared between seven inmates. The 18-year-old was shot by Bassam Hamzi in what Justice Virginia Bell described as a killing of considerable callousness. The trial heard how 25-year-old Brendan Fernando and his 27-year-old cousin Vesta Alan Fernando abducted Miss Hoare, assaulted her, then killed her. They're the worst of the worst. They're the people who present the most extreme risk to security and safety in our system. We were not allowed to interview prisoners who, as it turned out, preferred to keep their distance. We were able to interview staff. How do they treat you? The inmates. They're like everybody. They have their good and bad days. I've been called everything under the sun. Other days, I'll, they will apologise to me for swearing or saying something inappropriate around me. Do they threaten you? I have been threatened, yes. It doesn't happen on a daily basis. Even though the inmates are housed here and they've, some of them have committed terrible crimes, they're still people. And initially you're apprehensive around them. While they get to know you, you get to know them. But once you've worked them out to a degree, their management's quite simple. Since the discovery of a mobile phone smuggled in by a corrupted prison officer in 2003, everything entering the Supermax, including the food, is scrutinised. So why are you searched too? Because we make no exceptions, Chris. It demonstrates to the staff that there's no special circumstances, there's no compromise on security. So every single staff member? Every single time. staff member, the commissioner, the minister included. One thing that happens to you, of course, is that in some respects you treated like an inmate too. You're, you're searched. Do you resent that? Initially I did. I found it quite an invasion of my personal space and privacy, but I came quickly. You know, I'd always felt that the more we do to prove ourselves to be honest and professional and transparent, um, the better off we are in the long run. Hey, Chris, this is what we uh, call a safe cell. The prisoner's own term for the HRMU is the harm you. It's a short-term placement for inmates whilst they're a great threat to themselves of self-harm or suicide. Has uh, diagonally opposed cameras that are monitored all the time. Has uh, no hanging points whatsoever. Uh, even the blanket cannot be torn, cannot be made into a noose. The complaints that have filtered out speak of little natural light and too much time in cells. A minimum of 16 hours and a maximum of 22 hours per day is spent alone. In nearby cells, Christopher Binns endured similar solitary confinement. A couple of times I went on hunger strikes, so I bronzed myself up, I sh threw shit at the screws, you know, and acts of frustration because they just sent me mad. You know, it got to a point literally where I had enough of their shit. It was just brain numbing, numbing, you know, where it was just trying to wear me down mentally, you know, just to, to break me down, to wear me down. And at the end of the day, I said, I've had enough. I've had enough. I've had enough of your shit. You're going to cop mine. Prisoners are allowed closely supervised exercise. association with other inmates is limited. When they are moved, they are always outnumbered by officers. No one-on-one -on -one contact between inmates and prison officers is allowed. 
when you've got a small group of very manipulative inmates that are face to face with the same staff day in, day out for an extended period of time, uh, familiarity can develop. And so in that sense, it's, it's a corruption prevention strategy. How conscious are you of attempts to, say, manipulate you and try to take advantage of you? Are there those sort of mind games that go on all the time? On a, regu- on a daily basis. They, they try the Sympathy Act or they will try the... Uh, I guess they see females as a softer touch, but I think in actual fact females are more aware of being manipulated by male inmates than a male officer would be. A three-stage privileges and sanctions program rewards and punishes behaviour. Access to phone calls, movement, association and property such as television sets is controlled from above. I think their complaint is that this enables you to play God uh, and engage in petty mind games. Does that happen? I think it's a perception of theirs that, it, that it's mind games or allows us to play God. Uh, but it, it's, that's not what it's about. It's about control, controlling their behaviour here, and it does that very well. There are very few incidents within the HRMU, and that's because of that program. It takes a long time to get to the top of that program and get the maximum privileges, and so there's a reluctance to slide back down. Like to put your thumb on the reader for me, please, Mr. Walker. Inmates are allowed one contact visit a week. They also have access to the official visitor. Jack Walker looks in on the Aboriginal prisoners, two of whom were moved here following their 2002 attack on prison officers. They call it the harm you. Do you think it's a harmful environment? Well, you know, it would be locked up in the. Uh, but they get a little freedom in the place, you know, they can get their exercise of liberty of doing that. They got their own uh, uh, amenities like the, the TVs and other stuff in the jails, which they wouldn't get in outside if they hadn't had no money. It's, we're talking about Aboriginals, of course. But, you know, I, 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 I think it's a great setup to what's, you know, for the, for the crime that these fellas done. In its four years of operation, reports of attempted suicide and self-harm are few. But here, four years is a blink of the eye. It is obviously an area of heightened confinement. Is this not corrosive to psychological health? I think you'll find a lot of opinion and speculation about that issue, but in terms of evidence uh, that long-term incarceration or incarceration in, in more restricted conditions contributes uh, to poorer mental health. I don't think there's a great deal of evidence to, to support that. Um, where there have been studies done, um, even on, say, 60-day um, segregation orders or something like that, there has been no deterioration in the mental health status of, of inmates on those kind of orders. Longer term, um, I think the jury's still out. The sanitised environment can make Supermax look more like a clinic than a prison. Although the Nagel Royal Commission had recommended the opposite course of dispersing rather than concentrating serious offenders, New South Wales Corrective Services believes it's learned the lessons of history. It is a brutal environment. Do you think it is possible to, to manage to conduct the job in a way that is always above reproach? Well, I think, you know, I mean, if you walk through the supermax, you wouldn't call it... You don't get the sense that it's brutal. There's some brutal people there, and when you look at their offences and the, that they've committed, uh, it's, it's shocking. But you can walk through an, a, an institution such as the supermax jail, you don't get the feeling that it's uh, brutal get the feeling, in a way, that it's peaceful. And uh, so if it can be peaceful there, it can be peaceful in the rest of the system. Very little evidence of violence, of self-harm. Mm. It's, a, it's a very quiet and even peaceful place. Mm. Is 
no escapes. Mm. Is this an indicator of success? Of efficiency. It could be an indication of efficiency, but not necessarily effectiveness. The Supermax, half full at this stage, has a further facility which anticipates even tougher times to come. New South Wales so far has one AA classified inmate behind bars on terrorism charges. There is room for more. While we hope that we would never have to use it, we have to be prepared for that sort of eventuality. The inmate would sit on uh, that side and the visitor would be on this side. Behind that one-way glass there's an officer. Um, if it's a legal visit and documents need to be passed, to be signed or whatever, it goes through the shoots here and through the officer. Nothing has any contact whatsoever with the inmate and there's no potential for any contact with the inmate. Potential customers are not far away. While conversion to Islam is no concern to authorities, the prospect of recruitment to extremist groups is an issue. You know, I know a lot of people, um, a lot of Kuris in particular, have seen the seen armor, and I don't say that in a derogatory way. They they've been hanging out with the Lebanese, and maybe their faiths touch them. I don't know. We see some efforts to convert inmates to Islam for probably the wrong reasons. We haven't really have evidence for terrorist purposes in itself, but when it's for the wrong reason and when it's targeting violent people, it is a concern. What do you do to restrain the growth of terrorist gangs then? Well, our intelligence is very good and we've put a lot of money into making sure that our intelligence gathering process is, is excellent and uh, we work in conjunction with other law enforcement agencies with the swapping of intelligence and some of these people uh, convert in their mind, they convert and then they convert back. But we're worried we're certain prisoners that are doing very long sentences as an example uh, denounce their Aboriginality for Islam and uh, we've got photographs of them before and after. We monitor them very closely and uh, to us they're not terrorists in the real sense but they talk the talk. And uh, so if we had somebody who was recruiting in a prison uh, we keep them away from people that might be susceptible to conversion. Meanwhile, the yards fill up even more. Indigenous Australians, 2% of the population, make up 21% of the prison population. A newer trend is the increasing presence of female Aboriginal inmates. When you look at what's caused their offending behaviour, if a woman has been abused for years as a child and as an adult, and can get to a situation where they make a decision that they're going to hit back and they stab somebody or kill somebody that's been perpetrating that abuse on them for years, in a way you can understand why they do it. And of course you feel sorry for them. The eternal query that has stalked the corridors of Australian jails, are they bad or mad? is becoming easier to answer. Over one third of sentenced inmates have suffered mental disorders. The psychiatric beds lost when deinstitutionalization occurred account for many of the increased numbers jammed into penitentiaries. On this subject of mental health in prisons, even mortal enemies agree. There's no, there's no facilities and these people really don't belong in jail. And this jail is a violent place. People, because they're, how can I say it, easy targets, they can't defend themselves, there's no real great resistance. You've got people in there, you know, that would attack. They're out of boredom, you know what I mean? Really would attack people or give them a hard time. You know, these people don't need to be there. Really, they don't. So does prison make their condition better or worse? In some cases, it keeps them alive. And... Um they, um, because 
you can monitor them. You can monitor them very closely for the medication they require to assist them with their, their illness. And in my 40 years in the job, I've never seen the damaged product like it is now that's coming off the street. It's unbelievable. In our big remand jails, particularly of a Friday night, it's like a casualty ward. We carry them off the vans, help them off the vans. They're an absolute mess. And one of the first thing we do now is address their medical issues. On the good side, prison staff have moved a long way since the dark days of the Bathurst riots. There have always been good women and good men in the, the service of the department. Uh, I've always known them. But it looks as if the extent, the training uh, and, and other influences that have been brought to bear are producing in the minds perhaps of a new generation of prison officers a different view. We have the bashings in 70 and 74 at Bathurst. We have the systematic bashings at Grafton over a 33-year period, um, organised and approved um, by the department and indeed with the knowledge of a whole range of other participants, um, including people within government. Uh, and we still have some of the same prison officers who are there in the department, sometimes in some cases at reasonably high levels within the department, who, who actually took part in those bashings. And, and yet we've seen that culture of, uh, of systematic violence really brought to an end by the Nagel inquiry. And, and, and so that is a huge culture change. Those new skills and attitudes acquired over the last generation will be seriously tested. While conditions have improved since the 1970s, the concentration of drugs, gangs and mental illness has made the jail environment more toxic and the modern prisoner more predatory. So what's your sense at the end of the day? Does the average prisoner get out better or worse? Um, I don't know. I, I think that the opportunity is there for every prisoner to be released much better for the experience. Um, the exact number that take that up, there is a, a lot of them, but at the harder end of the scale, those doing longer periods, I think there's less. While the prison system has tightened its grip, it has done so on a time bomb. Australian jails have become the outer casing for not just the mad and bad, but dangerous cement them in public policy. It's become a sort of auction. I was the one who introduced that term. I can be tougher than you. No, you're not. We'll be tougher than you. And you finish up, um, in a sense, camouflaging so many other shortcomings in government administration by offering people at least one thing that they want and they feel better for, that is having a lot of people in jail. Having a tough policy on law and order and putting more and more people in jail is seen as being politically popular, however kind of irrational, foolish, counterproductive it might be in, in real terms, that just doesn't seem to matter. The toughness is easy to see, but jails are also fragile. The anger and pain is eventually released. The fatal arithmetic is most prisoners even the worst of them get out. And if we are worse for it, who is more to blame? Those who keep them here or those who put them here? You can view a special broadband edition of this program with extended interviews and extra features online now at abc.net.au slash four corners.